Stitchy Tube community. This is Teresa, and it's time for part two of my Stitchy Tube tutorial about picture framing your needlework. A tube tutorial is like a tutorial, but it's got tube at the front. I'm glad to have you back for, for part two. I don't know that there won't be a part three. Um, already with the posting of part one yesterday, I've had a lot of really good questions about picture framing. And so I encourage you to continue asking questions in the comments below, even if it's a year or two years or three years from when I post this. I'll kind of keep track of questions and as I compile um, more questions, I will post more tutorials about framing with what I know. I wanna stress that this is my technique. <laughs> it's not, the right way to do things. It's not the wrong way to do things. It's Teresa's way to do things. And so my sharing with you is just to show the way I do things, the way I was taught, the way I learned, the way I kind of cobbled together my ideas for how to do um, framing of needlework. You may agree with some of these. You may disagree. Um, framers all have different techniques. This is just my method and you're welcome to use or discard any parts of this that you like. And um, the video before I talked about how to choose your frame, whether or not to use matting, how to pick out glass if you want to do that. And so definitely check that out. I'll put a link below to part one. Um, but what we're going to do, and I'll show you in clips, is we're going to put together this piece here by Barbara Anna Designs. And I think it's called Funky Bird. And it was really fun to stitch. I stitched it on a 40 count fabric. I think it was just in DMC. And um, it's a 40 count piece of hand dyed kind of cool fabric I found online somewhere. And um, the frame is really neat. I got it at my local frame shop. I think for the frame and the foam, the frame and the foam core were maybe $25 or something like that for a custom frame, maybe $30. Um, I did go back and get a piece of glass so that I could show you all how to frame with a piece of glass in it. I don't normally use glass on my pieces because I feel like you can see the stitches much better when there's no glass but I wanted to show you how to frame with a piece of glass. And so I went ahead and got one. I got museum quality glass. This little piece was $15, even at my really inexpensive frame shop, but um, it will protect it from UV rays and um, keep the glare down. It really, it really like in person, it looks very clear. It's very, very clear. And so, um, you know, maybe that's worth the splurge. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go over real quick some of the tools and, and um, products that I've used to put this piece together. You can find a lot of these online and I'll talk about them kind of as I show them. Um, what you're gonna need first, oops, I shouldn't have put this all the way on the bottom. And there goes everything. Is you need um, foam core, piece of foam core, this is foam core. And it's foamy and corey and then a piece of um, mat board cut to the same size. The mat board does not have to be the same. Um, it doesn't matter what color the mat board is at all. You're gonna use it to back and I'll show that later. You can also get an extra piece of mat board cut if you'd like um, to have a piece of matting underneath your piece. Sometimes if you have a lot of carried threads or you have a lot of loose threads on the back, if you get a piece of mat board in kind of a neutral color that sort of matches your fabric, all of those boo-boos are going to disappear. And it's really a great tip um, for hiding your mistakes and your problems. I do it all the time because I'm kind of a sloppy stitcher. Um, I'm going to grab quick this thing that fell on the floor, which is an ATG gun. You can find these up oh, and my cover fell off, which is fine because you can see the inside of it. Um, you can find these online They're, I guess they're, you know, not too bad anymore. ATG gun. It's a 3M product, the ATG tape, and it's just a roll of sticky tape that's double sided that you can use for a lot of craft things. And so, I mean, to me, this is one of my top two, like I suggest you buy it tools for framing for stitchers, but you can use this for a lot of different things. An ATG gun sure is handy. The little rolls of ATG tape are just a couple dollars a roll. It is kind of a specialty item, so I don't know that this is anything you're gonna find at your local frame shop, but you definitely can find ATG guns online. Another item that you're gonna need is pins for um, stretching your needlework. I just get these at Hobby Lobby. What brand is this, Dritz? It's Dritz. But um, look for stainless steel if you can get them. I don't get the super long ones or the super short ones, just your standard pin, like sewing pin. It's got a flat head, not a ball head. Get, get the flat head pins. And um, 
stainless steel nickel works too a lot of times what i can find is nickel i try to buy them and they come in this little box and you can get like boxes of 750. um if you're getting them at hobby lobby save up that 40 percent daily coupon because the pins i think run about eight dollars for 750 of them but if you take 40 percent off that's pretty cheap way cheaper than paying the frame shop to stretch your piece for you and 750 pins will last a good long while but anytime you find pins grab them up because you'll use them Okay, another thing that you will need is a, either a roll or a piece of, you know, thicker paper. I actually got this roll of paper at a thrift shop for, I think, $2, and I've used a bunch of it. But I, I'm sure it was probably used for maybe packing packages, you know, for shipping. Um, it's kind of, you know, almost like a, it's a heavier weight paper. You can find rolls of this too if you go to like Lowe's or, or Home Depot near the painting supplies. They'll sell rolls of this brown paper and you can use that to back your pieces. It's really handy to have around. This is also great if you want to just roll a piece of it out and you're working on something real messy, just roll it out on your table. When you're done, you just throw it away. I have used in a pinch um, wrapping paper. You can use paper bags that you've cut up. If your piece is really small, you could use a really pretty piece of scrapbook paper, but um, it's nice to, to finish off the back of your piece with some backing. And, and this is what I use is that brown paper. And I used to, when I had a frame shop, I used to get it on really big rolls. And you can do that too if you do an awful lot of framing. Another thing that you can grab is um, if, you're, if you're going to use glass um, and you're not gonna use a mat, you're going to need spacers and i talk about that in my last video and i talk about it a little bit here too as i'm doing framing um, these are arlo brand framing spacers a-r-l-o and if you look online i actually found that you can buy tubes of these for super cheap where you get like 20 sticks of it for like 30 bucks i'm not going to tell you where just go google it because i haven't shopped with that company so i don't want to like give somebody a promotion if they're kind of crappy or whatever but arlo framing spacers and this is the eighth inch size you can also get quarter inch if you need a deeper amount of space but this is going to hold the glass off of your needlework so that they're not touching okay so it's spacers framing spacers um if you're going to do the the glass and the framing spacer obviously you're going to need a piece of glass from your frame shop um glass is not something that's easily cut at home just have your frame shop do it I, that's what I do. And people ask too, like, how do I cut my, my foam core or my mat board at home? Not easily. You can, you can totally do it with, um, you know, a straight edge ruler, but the frame shop is going to be able to do it super precisely and really cleanly. And so I don't bother with that at home, but in a pinch, you could use an X-Acto knife or a razor blade and um, cut it with a straight edge. Make sure that you've got a mat underneath so that you don't scratch up your table. But if you're going to do the spacers, um, a wire snippers is what you'll need to cut those with, to cut them to size. And I just use, you know, something that looks like this. Um, sometimes, um, and you'll need this tool too, a needle nose pliers a lot of times will have an edge in there that you can use to cut things too. You could cut the head off a nail, um, you can cut wire with that, but you can cut these spacers with that edge on a needle nose pliers too. Um, these are really nice because they're, they spring back and so they're kind of easy on your hands and they're easy to use. But a needle nose pliers, this is another really handy tool to have. I use this to put on the hangers and I show that um, just later in the clip, but needle nose pliers. And those are available. Needle nose pliers and, and wire clippers are gonna be available at any store and you need a hammer. And this hammer actually Harrison gave to Steve like back when he was five and we've still got this cute little hammer. And if you twist it apart, it's got screwdrivers inside, but okay. Um, you will need hangers and I'm not showing how to put a wire hanger on the back of your frame this time. Maybe next time, maybe next video I'll show how to do that. But you'll, you're going to need, um, if you've got a smaller piece, you get these little, they're called sawtooth hangers because it looks like a saw. And then this is a longer one. I just used a shorter one for this one because it was a really little piece. And then when you buy packs of these at the hardware store, they usually come with these tiny little nails. And um, sometimes you can find an assortment where you get a number of different kind of picture framing hangers in a pack, and those are handy to have. I don't find that the wire they give with those is the best quality, but it, it, it's fine, it'll do. Um, you can also get some bumpers. I have felt bumpers here at home, but you can get rubber bumpers, kind of plasticky bumpers, and those work great too. If 
you know, you can ask your local frame shop if they're, if you're getting a custom frame from them you could say, Hey, can I have two bumpers for the back? They may just give them to you, but you can buy these at craft stores too, or hardware stores bumpers. And you're going to get just like maybe a sheet of, you know, 30 of them in a pack, but you need those. And then another handy tool to have is a center finding ruler and um, quilters use these sometimes too. And so I saw that you can get them at Joann's for like $4, not the, not the metal ones, but you can get a plastic one. And this is gonna help you find the center of where to put your hanger on the back of your piece. So there's that. And then the last, I think this is the last tool um, is a, um, a brad gun. And sometimes these are called point guns. And you can find these online too. Fletcher makes a really good one. This one is Aroma, R-O-M-A, not Aroma, but it's R-O uh, hyphen M-A. And I've had this for a long time. It, it hasn't, it jams. It was expensive. It was probably $75. I saw that you can get the Fletcher point guns online for like $50. It is so nice to have a point gun. Like if you were going to splurge on one framing tool, get a point gun or a brad gun. They just make things so much easier. Um, and you can, you can easily at home, like if you've got a piece where it's like, oh, some dust fell in there, or oh, I want to change the mat out, or oh, I'm just going to restretch that. This makes it so you can take something apart and put it back together at home, no problem. Because the rest of this stuff is probably miscellaneous tools that you've got around the house. Okay, so that's that. Um, I hope you enjoy this. I'm going to edit the clips together and then I'll share some comments at the end um, if there's anything I forgot or, or kind of final things I want to say. But... I'm gonna teach you now how to stretch your needlework. See you in a minute. Okay, we are gonna get started on stretching this little piece and it's super cute. I'm coming uh, to this project with my uh, foam core already and I've attached a piece of mat board to it that's, this one's just a little bit darker than the fabric. I would have liked it a little lighter, but um, I'll show you what that's gonna do. I carried you can see I've got a few little carries here between my letters, which is pretty common. I'm just a lazy stitcher, I guess. And um, so if I would put that on top of white foam core, I don't know if you can see this, you can see little areas where the carries are, okay? But if I flip this and use the darker, all of a sudden all of that disappears, which is pretty amazing. And so that's a little tip that you can take from me to you. Now, um, the other things that I've got for this part are um, pins and my frame. And we're gonna use both of those to get this in there just right. Now this piece um, has one border here. Anytime you've got a straight border, that's gonna create problems in one way because you're gonna want that border to look straight, but it's the positive thing is that it's going to make it easy to line things up. Um, I can see already that this, I think this piece, she finished like a circular something. And so it's not, you know, like a definite rectangly kind of a shape. So um, what I do when I'm going to stretch a piece is I hold it up to the light so that I can see on the edges where the frame is going to go. And I can kind of adjust it this way and that way until I get it till it's about straight. And so um, now these pins are... I try to get, um, got fuzz in there. Oh no, it's a needle with thread on it, how neat. Um, I've, oh no, it's a pin. I've got um, pins that you just get at the, frame, at the uh, quilting store or the, the hobby store, whatever, the craft store. Um, you can get them in packs of like 750 and that's what I get. And when I used to have a frame shop, I used to buy them multiple packs at a time. I would get everything that they had in these 750 packs. If you can find stainless steel, that's even better. These may be nickel plated. It's not always possible to find the stainless steel ones. The stainless steel are going to resist rust the best, but I just really haven't had much problem with any kind of these, these threads. So um, you find where you want your piece to be. And I'm just kind of looking at the light around and where everything hits. And you're looking for this space here and here and here and here to be really close to even and um, you can break out your ruler for this. It almost looks like this is like, it kind of goes in a little bit, like this isn't really a totally symmetrical piece, but that's okay. So then what I'm gonna do is just pick two sides. I don't, it doesn't really matter if it's the long sides or the short sides and just stick a pin right in to the sides of the foam core, just like that. 
Okay, and then I'm gonna do the same thing to the top and the bottom, just kind of make sure it's centered and put a pin in and put a pin in. This is so cute. It's kind of a wonky little piece. Okay, so everything is kind of centered. It's and then what you can do is use your frame, lay it on top, and see, you know, did I, let's see if I can find where the corners are. Does that look like it's gonna be straight? Uh, it looks like it's almost a little closer at the bottom than it is at the top. So, mm, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reposition this. Okay. Stretching is really, I think it's kind of fun. And it's one thing that you may notice, I, I don't know, probably over the years my finger has just said, you know what, I give up. Because you're gonna be pushing a lot of pins into the side of your foam core and it, it, they go in fairly easily, but your finger will get sore. And so if you're finding that your finger is getting sore, go ahead and um, get one of those, um, oh, what do you call it? Like a, it's like a thimble, you know, like a leather thimble kind of a thing to protect the tip of your finger. Okay, and I can see, I sometimes just use my finger, like that goes about to the start of my first knuckle, about to the start of my first knuckle, about to the start of my first knuckle. So that's pretty, that's pretty even. And you can be as fussy with that as you want to be. So that's, that's pretty, pretty well started. So then I guess I usually start frame, uh, the stretching on the longer sides. And um, so you can take one of the pins out, you know, see where it's at. And then I usually do this right up against my belly, but I'm gonna try to do this on the counter. Push a pin all the way in, okay? And then you can do the same thing on the other side. Again, I'm just gonna make sure it looks even. Oop, sorry guys. And I'm gonna push a pin Let's see if I can turn this light on and make it a little bit brighter in here. Push this pin all of the way in. Okay, and again, I kind of look like, is that, is that about the right, right amount of space side to side? And it looks like it's pretty good. Then what you want to do is you're going to work your way, so I've got pins in the middle and in the middle. And I'm gonna alternate and do a few here, and then 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 a few here, all the way to the corner, and then go back to the center and do the same thing. A few here, a few here, a few here, a few here, all the way to the corner. And that's no matter what size piece you've got. I put them probably like three eighths of an inch or so apart. You don't want them to be too far apart because what'll happen is you'll get waving between, because it'll pull tight and then it'll be loose, and then it'll pull tight and then it'll be loose. So you want them fairly close together so you, so you get kind of a more even look. And what I'm doing um, is I'm visually, I'm gonna put my glasses down here. I'm, gonna, I'm visually following the line of the fabric. This is a 40 count fabric, but I'm looking at where the line hits next to that first pin. And then I want that same line of thread to just follow all of the way up. And that's how you get things straight, as you're just following that line. You don't wanna pull it too tight and you don't wanna pull it too loose. So here you can see I've got three pins in there, you know, about three eighths of an inch apart, half an inch, something like that. And then same thing on the other side. Now one thing that I'm constantly checking for is if this, if, is this, going to, does that still look centered? And I think it does. I'm going to actually pull it out, kind of look and see. I think that was pretty well centered. It just seems like the fabric is wanting to curve this way a little, so I'm kind of trying to watch out for that. So I'm going to pull it and tuck it. Am I still in camera shot? Yes, I am. And again, I'm following that line. So I'm going opposite of the ones that I just did. And I'm pulling here with this hand and you just you can pull tighter or let up a little bit just so that you're getting that thread to fall in the right place now if you're new to stretching and it's difficult for you to see 
what you're doing. What you could do is just take some just random thread, and it doesn't matter what color, and just do like a quick kind of in and out, I don't know what do you call that, kind of a stitch all the way across, and, you, and pull it out when you're done stretching it. But then you can follow just that kind of cheater line all the way across, and if you see that it starts to dip down a little, you know you have to pull that a little bit tighter. So um, again, I'm gonna go um, a few here, and then a few, a few, whoops, where am I, opposite, okay, a few over here. And so I can see this, the lines are starting to dip down, so I know that I have to give it a good tug to pull those a little bit tighter. Pull a little bit tighter. Pull a little bit tighter. Now, um, you can, anytime you feel like, oh my gosh, this is getting wonky, and actually these cheater or these you know these first pins you put in can come out now because we've got it kind of tacked in place what you can do then is while you're stretching pop it in your frame from time to time and, and say you know is, is that looking straight and like I said this piece doesn't have definite borders but to me it's looking like it's pretty good so far um, I think I really do think that the spacing here is different than the spacing here what what I look for is for the linen lines or the Ada lines you want those at 90 degree angles. A lot of times when you get things framed at a frame shop and they're not needle workers, I think they look at this in a different way. And sometimes you'll find that the, the okay, so as I was saying, sometimes, um, you know, at the frame shop, the linen lines or the Ada lines are gonna curve one way or another. And I notice that as a needle worker, they probably don't notice that as a frame shop, but it bugs me. And so as, as much as I love wonky and weird and as much as not of a type A I am, I'm kind of type A about my stretching being straight, but that's just me. You do it. You do you. Um, so you're just checking and checking to see if these, you know, if everything's looking straight and it's looking pretty good so far. And so um, I'm going to continue stretching, um, just, you know, tacking in, watching that line, pushing pins in, pushing a couple in. Um, pushing a couple in and um, it really it's pretty a it's a pretty quick process once you get the hang of it and um, let's see are you still able to see this is this is a tricky filming process here I'll just kind of try to get to the corner here okay and then what I do is I just check, like is that, that's pretty, pretty straight. I'm not gonna worry about the fine tuning right now. But I've done, oops, I got one more to do here. I've got both of these sides all the way to the corner. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just finish going to this corner and then I'll come right back. All right, I'm back. And I hope this is filming, let's see. So um, I, I finished, stretching to both corners on both sides. And so that's what it looks like. And then it's time to take stock and say, okay, does this follow your lines across and is it pretty straight? When you're working with something really fine, like a 40 count, it's, it's tricky to get it perfectly straight. I'm pretty happy with this one. Um, but let's say that you noticed like, oh, this thread is starting to droop and this, and this line is starting to go this way. What you start doing is you just pull pins out. You start, where it, start with the pin where it's starting to droop you can pull all the pins out to the corner then, or just pull them out one at a time, and then um, pull it tighter or let it loose. And here, we'll just take these out and pretend like we're going to the corner. And then adjust it that way. And you can pull out as many or as few as you want. Let me tell you this, you're never gonna be sorry, <laughs> I don't think, you're never gonna be sorry that you took the extra step to remove some pins and put them back in and make it a little bit straighter. Um, it is a hassle once you've got something finished to go back and fix it because there's, you know, there's kind of a process to covering, covering up the back of your piece and getting everything, you know, put together. And so taking it apart is kind of a bummer. So this is one thing that you, you definitely want to spend time on. Now what you can do is um, you can take a ruler too. Um, I, like I said, a lot of times I just use my finger to see if things are spaced evenly. This is a tricky one to frame because this T is not lined up with that G and this Z goes in. And so it's, it's definitely not, 
you know, kind of a symmetrically shaped piece. But then what you're gonna do is do the same thing. So I'm gonna start at the top and um, do a couple, then go to the bottom and do a couple, and the same thing all the way to the corners. I'm gonna do that and I'll be right back. I was wondering if this would happen and I'm kind of glad that it did. It often does when I'm stretching. Um, I've, got it, I've got it stretched, every, every side has got pins in it and I can check it with my frame. And you know, to me that looks, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? But um, when I'm looking at this, what I'm noticing is that once I got the top and the bottom stretched, I'm noticing that the linen threads on this side, and sometimes it'll be both sides, are kind of angling this way. Now this here and this here I feel like are pretty straight. This is kind of curving that way, and I don't like that. So um, what I do is, and this is tough on your nails, ladies, so if you like to have nice nails, too bad. <laughs> because I just, I've never had nice nails, and this is why. Because I just use my nails like tools, right? And um, I'm going to pull them all out because I want that to be straight. It's going to bug me if it's not straight. So I just take them all out. And then, you know, it's going to, I'm going to maybe try to shift this a little bit so that it's straighter. And I'm going to go ahead and restretch that. And then we're going to check it again. Okay, that's a lot better. I'm much happier with that. And I feel like now the linen lines are at 90 degree angles, straight up, straight down, and, and tight. And um, so that, to me, that looks really good. We'll check it one more time with the frame because you want to see, you know, does this... See, now this is, this is misleading too because this part of this line, either I made a mistake or it's designed to be off. My linen lines are straight, but this line is one stitch up above this line. Isn't that funny? Oop, I'm sorry, you couldn't even see that. This line here is up, up above one stitch. It's one stitch higher than this line, and I'm only noticing that now. Either I made a mistake or, or it was just designed crooked, which I like. It's fine with me, whatever, I don't care. But I do like that my linen lines are pretty straight. And this is a point at which, like, mm, I'm looking, it looks pretty straight, pretty straight. You want it to be nice and taut. You don't want your, you don't want there to be bubbles and gaps. Pull it tight. Here, I could maybe, I feel like I could maybe just tighten this just a little bit to make it even a little bit straight. I'm just taking one pin out and pull it a little tighter and pull it a little tighter. There we go. That's, I'm going to be happier with that. And there you go. You do want to be careful. Um, you know, I kind of take a lot of things for granted just because I've done this so many times. Um, it's tricky to learn how to put push the pins in straight in. Um, please be careful. You're going to, and I've, I did it and you'll do it. And that's just how it goes. Um, sometimes you're going to push your pin too much this way or too much that way. And it's going to come poking out the back of your foam core. Or it's going to come poking out the front. Um, so just be aware that you're, you may stick yourself a few times, um, but it's worth it. You got to bleed for your art, right? So um, to me, this looks good. It looks real good, actually. So what I do then as one kind of last final thing is these pins I've pushed in with my fingers pretty well, but then I take and I set it on the tabletop and I kind of rock it and push down, rock it and push down, rock it and push down like this so that they're all a little bit more flush. They'll kind of, you know, be more flush with the side that way. And that's really good. Now, um, the cool thing about stretching this way, and this is the pinning technique, I leave those pins in. If you use, you know, good pins, you shouldn't have trouble with rusting. If you ever wanted to take this out and make a bag out of it or an ornament, you just pop it out and pull all the pins out and nobody is the wiser that it used to be framed. You may have to give it an iron or you may have to clean it, but um, that's, that's pretty neat. Now, sometimes it's going to happen where you've, my piece I didn't center, obviously, I guess. You can trim if you want to. I always leave all the fabric on because you never know if you're going to want to take this out and do something else with it. And that, that extra fabric may come in handy. But if you really have, sometimes you'll stitch a piece, you know, and you've got a big, big flap of fabric, go ahead and just trim that off. You don't have to do anything with the corners. If you want you can kind of tuck the corner in like this and like this, you know, and then you could, you could whip stitch a little bit and whip those, whip stitch those corners together. I don't do that. Um, I'm going to show you next how to, how to put this in the frame. 
Okay, now I told you guys that I normally don't use glass with my pieces and I just really don't, but I kind of felt like since I was doing a tutorial that I would show you how to do it um, just so that you could see. So you could see if you want to do glass. And it's in glass, like I said in my previous video, glass, there's no real right or wrong wrongness to it. It's a personal preference thing. Sometimes it depends on where it's hanging. I went ahead and got a piece of museum glass at my frame shop. I hadn't, <laughs> I just normally don't buy glass. This little piece of museum glass was $15. But the rest of the project was really cheap. I think I maybe only paid, I don't know, $30 for the frame, the foam core, and the mat board that I'm, I'm using. So um, this is Spacer, and um, I'll talk about that in another part of my video, but you get it in lengths, and you may be able to, to buy it at your local frame shop too, but um, you just use a, you know, like a wire cutter is what I use, that kind of a thing, and I'm gonna measure, oop, here, let's get this up so you can see it. I'm gonna set it in and see how long I need it. I need to cut it right here, Oh, oh. It's like five feet long. So I'm just going to take it here, clip it, Oop. and then there's just this little sticker on the back. And so it's a 3M sticker, which is really cool. You peel it off, and then I'm just going to set it right on the edge of the glass and press it down. Okay? And we're going to just do that to every side. A lot of times I'll do like the top and bottom. And, um, and then I'll do the sides last. So um, in my other video, I talk about spacers and why you should use spacers with your needlework. I'll mention it here too. Anytime you know, you've got fabric, um, especially needlework, you don't really realize how much moisture and like just kind of detritus is in uh, your needlework. And so if you've got your glass sitting directly on top of your needlework, you're going to get a fog or a film that kind of develops between the needlework and the glass. And it's going to create a foggy appearance and that moisture can kind of eat away at the fibers, which isn't the best thing in the world. Um, I'm not a stickler for rules. Spacers with glass is kind of a rule of mine but you know, it's up to you. It's totally up to you. Just be aware that, that it's may, things may get a little foggy if you, um, if you put your glass right on top of your needlework. Okay. All right, last one. You really gotta pop that. Peel the sticker off. It's, it's kind of fun, actually. Okay, and then just lay it in. And you don't want those to show. These are clear. Um, there are companies that make spacers that are black, and there are... There used to be anyway, I don't know if they make them anymore, there used to be kind of an S-shaped spacer where you kind of clipped it onto the edge of your glass. These are so much easier than that. And so I don't know if you can see kind of the spacers are sitting in there. Now this museum glass had a right way and a wrong way and the frame shop uh, made sure to show me which side needed to be the side facing out. So um, do ask if you've gotten any kind of specialty glass if there is a right or a wrong way to do that. I, you will notice that now we have eaten up some of the space of this frame with the, um, the spacer and the glass. That's eaten up some space. We're gonna put the needlework on top of that and then I get a piece of extra mat board to cover up the edges. And the reason I do that is to just kind of preserve the fabric a little bit. If you, this is a, this is a Brad gun. See, his name is Brad. Ah! And um, these, are, these are handy little tools to have. You also can get something called a point gun and that shoots in little diamond shapes. Brad shoots in little, um, he shoots in little, you know, kind of, they're kind of staply nails. They're not super big, but um, that's what Brad does. Mine tends to stick, so I gotta bang it every time I pop one in. Um, this is a Roma F18, 18 millimeter Brad gun and you have to buy refills of those Brads. But if, if I were to point this in like this, what happens is when it shoots that point in, it'll tear the fabric. It grabs the fabric every time it touches it and pops a hole in it. And to be honest, I've done that too. <laughs> but if, if you want to preserve your needlework and you want to you know, have it be nice so that if you wanted to take it apart and do something else with it, this is the technique that I use to cover up just the edges so that the brads aren't 
going directly in there. Now one thing I'll do when I've got glass is I'll flip it back over and make sure there aren't any hairs or um, you know just kind of whatever. Mainly looking for cat hair but um, dust particles that kind of thing. What you can do um, I looked for my my framing brush and I just I, it's probably in the garage somewhere but you can get a stat a static free brush to brush your glass with to get the particles out you can use a flour sack towel or even just a very clean paint brush and just sweep sweep the glass you can kind of touch up underneath like this to just kind of brush any of the dust off um, with this museum glass, you want to handle it as little as possible. And the frame shop instructed me that um, I cannot use any kind of a regular cleaner with this. They said if, they said really just don't touch it. <laughs> but if you have to touch it, just a flour sack towel or, you know, a kind of a lint-free cloth of some kind, you can just kind of rub a smudge off. But just, they said don't touch it, don't touch it. <laughs> so the, um, what I do it then is, now this sticks up a little bit. I don't, this wasn't a super deep frame. So what I'm gonna do is pop it like that and see there that, that brad is driven in. Sorry, I gotta make noise. And there we go, and that's set. And then I'll flip it around and I'll kind of tuck in the fabric on this other side. Cause I don't wanna, I don't wanna screw up the fabric. Um, I don't know if other frame shops do this little thing of putting the, the mat board on it. I guess because I'm a needle worker, like I really care that my fabric not get destroyed. <laughs> so, oop, now that one, that one didn't pop in very well, did it? There we go. Um, this stupid brad gun has always stuck like that. I've never been able to figure out how to make it not do that. But um, how close you put your brads together is up to you. This is a step that you can save for the frame shop. If you don't have a brad gun, these actually aren't cheap. I want to say they're like $75-ish. If you, It's a great tool to have, oh my gosh. I mean, if I was going to say for a stitcher, like, what one framing tool, this is it. This is absolutely like the primo framing tool to get as a brad gun. And there are other brands. Um, this Roma brand is used by a lot of framers. Um, but you can just look for other brad guns. I like that it's yellow. It stands out on your workbench. So then, you know, once again, you can check and see, is it in there straight? Yep, it's pretty straight. Is there any dust in there? Nope, it looks pretty good. Um, if you would need to pull the brads out, you can actually just use this same um, tool and just wiggle this and pop it pop it right out and wiggle it and pop it right out just be aware that you're gonna create little dust particles where you know where the wood has chipped a little and those may float onto your frame so you may need to brush a little bit um, sometimes we used compressed air at the frame shop to really blow it out you don't really realize as a as a framing customer how much dust you know is in a frame shop because you're cutting frames you're cutting paper you've got glass particles and it's a constant fight to keep things clean and to keep prints, especially dark, anything dark. Um, so there you go, I'm pretty happy with that so far. Now we're gonna put the backing on. I'm not even gonna pause, because this is we're just gonna keep trucking right along. Tool number two, <laughs> if I had to suggest for framing, for, uh, for a stitcher, is an ATG gun. And um, this is kind of a crappy one, it broke almost right away, but um, it wasn't cheap either. You get these rolls of double stick tape and it just goes right into this gun and it allows you to lay down without you know any cutting or trimming or anything to lay down sticky lines. And so what you do is you just, I'm gonna pull in on the trigger and do this close to the edge, not right at the edge. Just close to the edge. Close to the edge, close to the edge. How easy is that? Now you can use um, double stick tape that you just get in a roll from the craft store is fine. There's lots of different products like that. You can use Elmer's glue, you can use wood glue. Um, you're gonna need some drying time. If you use glue of any kind, you just put a thin, thin line of glue here. And I actually, um, if I when I use glue, I rub it 
rub it in a little bit to make it even thinner. When I worked at the Great Frame Up and was helping people frame their own pieces, a lot of times people would just blah, 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 like put so much glue and it would take forever to dry. You really just need a little touch of glue, okay? And then here is a piece of brown craft paper. And the way that I cut this to size, there, there are a few ways that you can trim this. What I do is get out the roll of paper, lay my frame on top of the paper, use a pencil or a pen to draw around the edges, and then you're gonna trim it just a little bit smaller than that edge so that it doesn't hang off the edge at all. That's the easiest way to do it at home. Um, framers, I'm gonna go ahead and stick this down. Framers get pretty good at trimming paper because it's you just do it every day all the time. Okay, good. It's not going to stick out at all. Framers, what framers will do is um, a lot of times they'll just use like a raw razor blade. And I've done it a million times. And you just hold it in your hand and you just whoop, draw it down the edge of the frame. What you do is you, you get the paper so that it hangs out over the edge, fold the paper over the edge and that way you can see where the line of the frame is and either use a I used a raw razor blade they make a little tool that you can cut the edge with too or you could use an exacto knife and then you just want to cut trim to that edge but this is a pretty easy way for you to know exactly the size you need and um, get it what to you know to where you want it now um, when you put the backing on a lot of time you can see there are little wrinkles here especially since this one sticks out just a little bit and I like the back to look nice and tight. So um, I'm gonna just use <laughs> a little Windex. Water in a, in a spray bottle would probably work better, but I don't, think I, I don't think I have anything like that. So I'm just gonna oops, lightly spritz with Windex or water. Water would be preferable. Um, and then we're gonna let this dry for a few minutes. And as it dries, this paper is going to magically tighten and it's gonna look great. So I'm gonna pause and we'll be right back. Here we go. This is just really about dry. It'll tighten up a little bit yet, but um, I'm pleased that it's pulled a lot of the wrinkles out. And um, it just is gonna be a little more wrinkly when your, your piece kind of bumps out of the back a little bit, but that's okay. So we're gonna put the hanger on it now. I've laid a towel down since we're gonna be working with the frame flat. Uh, that way it's not gonna get scratched up from sliding around. In a frame shop, you're typically gonna use, they call them rubber bumpers, and they're kind of strips of just rubber that you lay down and you, you set the frame on top of that rubber so the frame doesn't scratch. Uh, the first step is make sure you know which way is top. And um, I cannot tell you how many times I have put the hanger on the wrong side. I can tell you how many times, roughly one million times. So <laughs> make sure that you know Okay, this is the top, so I'm gonna flip it over like this. The top is right here. And then here's the centering ruler. I showed you this earlier. And so what we're gonna do is find the center of the top to put our, this is called a sawtooth hanger. And you can find these at most hardware stores. They're very inexpensive. You can use them for project, a, a lot of framing projects you can use a sawtooth hanger. I think maybe in a future video I'll do maybe more involved framing techniques and I'll show y'all how to put a wire across the back. But this is definitely a lightweight enough piece that a sawtooth hanger is gonna be just fine. Um, and so you, you take your centering ruler and you find what you're looking for is the same number here and here. This circle here, this little circle with the arrows, shows you where the center is. And so you're looking for the same measurement side to side. And you just kind of slide it back and forth until they match. When you frame every day for a living, you really get so you don't need one of these and you really just can find it, you know, pretty automatically. But um, it is always good to check. And so it looks like about four and three quarters and four and three quarters is going to make it roughly center. And so you can, if you want, just you know, follow this up and make a little mark so that you know where the center is, okay? And um, then your sawtooth hanger a lot of times is going to have a little bump there. And that little bump is the center of the hanger. And then that's gonna show you where to put it there. Uh, I've got the center of the top here marked with pencil right where the center was. And like I said, the little dot here is gonna go there. Now, if you're gonna hang your picture on the wall, what you can do is take a pencil or you know a crayon or something and color on that dot, scrape some of the lead off or something with color onto the dot. 
Then find your place on the wall that you want it. Press the picture up against the wall and it's gonna leave a little mark where your nail should go. I bet you didn't know that how to use. So um, here's a little tip for me to you. It's tricky. These little nails are tiny to put these in. And it's like, okay, how do I hold that and get it in without banging the heck out of my fingers? You wanna get a needle nose pliers. In a pinch, I have used a pair of scissors. <laughs> you gotta make do with what you got. So let's make sure that this is centered. Um, I will tell you, you know, sometimes these nails have a little length to them. These are longer um, sawtooth nails. And sometimes your lip here, it, it may be really thin here. Your frame may be really thin here. So just pay attention. You may need to slide this down a little ways so that your nail, in fact, I'm going to do that on this one because this does have a lip. I think it's going to be okay, but you, um, you don't want your nail to poke through the front of your frame. So then you just take your needle nose pliers and you just hold your nail in like that, position it right in the hole, and tap it on down. Super easy, kind of fun. Do my next one, do this. There you go, and that's in place. Now, if you needed to pull this off for some reason, let's say you accidentally got it in the wrong place, or like me, you've put it, this, I know this is right side up, but let's say you, you put it on the wrong side. You can just take your same needle nose pliers and just pry it off. You're gonna end up with marks, you know, where your nails went in, so if you, if you want, you can re-back it if that's gonna bother you. And then, um, you, you know, kind of the finishing touch is to use bumpers. Let's get this corner in. So this is the bottom of the frame. And these are bumpers, and I've got rolls of them just from my days of having a frame shop. You can buy bumpers at your frame shop. You can maybe ask if you can buy some, but they sell them at any hardware store. Sometimes they're going to be rubber. These are felt. Um, the rubber ones are nice because they'll kind of prevent your frame from slipping and sliding on the wall. These will a little bit too. Bumpers really are to protect your wall from scratching from the frame and to keep your frame in position. Now this one... This, this one, it, it sticks up a little bit on the back. The, the, the uh, piece in the frame is a little bit deeper than the frame itself. So sometimes what you can do is find the corner there and actually put a bumper right on you know, the edge of where your piece sticks out. And then that's, that's really gonna be the part that touches the wall. So I think that's what I'm gonna do on this one. And there are a few other things that you can do now that you've got your piece backed. I will say, if you, if you don't have this kind of paper, you can definitely use wrapping paper. I've used paper bags where I cut the paper bag apart and um, you know, cut it to size. You could use newspaper. You, know, you could just recycle some, some large sheets of paper that you have around the house. Um, another thing that you can do that I do sometimes, especially if I'm giving it as a gift, is I'll sign it with a pen and say, you know, stitched by Teresa with love for Christmas. 1994 or whatever and sign it. Another thing that you can do, and I haven't done this in a long time and I need to get back to it, is you can get, especially if it, this is a small, this is a pretty small framed piece, but you can get an envelope and just like a manila envelope of any size um, or um, I've even made them just out of this paper where I just kind of tape, I'll tape along the edges here and then lay a sheet down and create a pocket on the back and you can actually tuck your pattern right into the back of your frame. And then that way, if a friend comes over and says, oh my gosh, I love that piece, do you still have the pattern? You can pull it off the wall and say, yes I do, and here it is, and it's right there with your piece. And it kind of saves it too as a memento if anybody would be interested to know, you know about the original designer or what the chart looked like. It's gonna be right there with the piece hanging on the wall. And that's a really cool thing to do. But you could also, you know, just get like a regular any, any other kind of a regular envelope and just double stick tape it to the back. It's kind of a neat thing to do. Um, so that's, that's put together and that's actually just ready to hang on the wall. And I'm pretty happy with how that looks. Still raining outside and I've just finished kind of piecing the video together. I, I made a few notes of just a few, few last kind of thoughts of things for you to know. Um, for the foam core, when you have your frame shop cut foam core, it is easier if they cut you quarter inch foam core, which is a deeper foam core. This time my frame shop gave me 3 16 inch foam core. I forgot to specify. 
and it just is a little bit thinner so there's less room to push your pins in. I guess, you know, with this one it worked out fine because the frame wasn't very deep and so um, it did save me a little bit of room to have that that uh, thinner foam core. Neither one is really, you know, more right or, or more wrong than the other. It's just that sometimes the quarter inch wide is just easier to work with. Um, I did mention, I have mentioned lacing and lacing isn't something that I'm good at. It's not something I plan on doing a video about. There are lacing videos here on YouTube if you just do a quick search for lacing. Um, basically, it's like lacing a shoe. You pin it like I did and then you run string or thread between and lace it this way and then lace it this way and then a lot of times pull the pins out. And then that way, really the only thing that's touching your needlework besides the foam core is thread. And so it's, um, it's a very good technique. Um, it, uh, with these antique samplers, a lot of times the way they stretch their needlework is they nailed it with nails to a board. And so a lot of times it's just like rusty holes and old cruddy nails. Um, so there are techniques are better, uh, definitely these days. Now, if you can't do your own closing, like, you know, use the brad gun, and you know, put the backing fabric on. If that's something you just don't have the tools and supplies to do, frame shops will do that for a nominal fee, if at all, it just depends. Sometimes I've had them where they're just like, nah, we'll just throw that together for you real quick. And sometimes they'll charge you a couple dollars or whatever, whatever their price is. I actually worked at one gallery where closing was really expensive, but it was kind of a hoity-toity, hoity-toity place. But you, do, you don't have to, you can stretch your needlework and then just take it back to the frame shop and, and have them close it up for you if you don't wanna mess with the rest of that. As you can see from my tutorial here, it's not difficult, but it does help if you have the right tools and supplies. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is stretching a piece with a definite border. Some needlework has borders, you know, like you can see the samplers behind here have a definite, you know, like a floral undulating border, or you might have a, a piece with a you know definite line around the edge. Those are tricky to stretch because even when you're following that linen line or that Ada line alongside the edge of your foam core, every little wave is gonna make that line just, you know, kind of wave a little bit. And so it's a very fussy, particular thing to do to stretch needlework, especially when it's just a straight line, when it's got a straight line around the edge. And so you really are gonna wanna take your time if you've got a definite border to pull and tug and just adjust, pull pins out, stick them back in, make sure that you get it just right. Like I mentioned in the video, you're never gonna be sorry you took extra care to make sure that your piece was as straight as you would like it. And um, it's it's gonna bug you. If, you. if you frame it and it's not straight, you're gonna see it. And that's, to me, that's annoying when you can see the mistakes in your own pieces. Um, so that's all, that's all I've got for today. Um, me and Funky Bird, Funky Bird and I, thank you for, um, for joining us. This was a fun project. Please do ask questions below. And as I collect enough questions, I'll make more videos about framing. And hopefully I can help you understand framing and maybe help you accomplish some of your own framing from the comfort of your own home in your slippers. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.